So CI, um, continuous integration um, and the data warehouse. Um, I think that just to give you some background, I've uh, been working with data warehousing and the BI space for, for donkey's years, as you can see by, by my age. But um, I think it was only a few years ago that I actually joined a team that were doing and practicing CI. And it was a revelation re re in the sense of it was so different. The, the, the benefits of it were just vast. And I, hopefully, you'll go away from tonight's presentation and think about uh, using CI in your own environments. So I'll be talking about uh, lots of um, what is CI and all that kind of stuff and the tools and techniques for CI. Um, I'll be talking about platypus as an octopus and a PowerShell and stuff like that. Uh, how all, the, all these small animals go and get drunk on sake. But anyway, we'll come back to that. Um, so very much CI is you know, team working together. They, they check their source code into a, a common repository. The key thing is that that code is then verified. And it's verified by doing a build. Most people have a build going. That's, I don't consider that CI, really. Yeah, it kind of proves that the code works together. The key thing is it's actually got to go and deploy. And it's got to deploy not only against, a, in a database terms, uh, an empty database, but also against a, uh, a, a current copy of production. And it's got to go through a test cycle. And that's when the errors get detected. And you can go back and fix them. Um, I think the key reason why uh, CI is not used in a data warehouse context is because most BI professionals are just not familiar with its the tools and the benefits it can provide. Uh, they, they just, and also, they kind of go, how the hell can this work? Because we've got data that changes all the time. And of course, the data is the barrier. The, the production data um, obviously is different from your dev data. And in lots of environments, it's never the same because they won't even let you some, some banks won't even let you restore prod data into dev, all that kind of stuff. And obviously, as soon as you've got prod data, you've got huge volumes. And the time taken to load into a CI environment can, can be onerous. So those are the kind of back the um, uh, things that stop CI being used in a data warehousing context. But when you start looking into CI and kind of thinking, well, what is it that um, I need to look for in my solution? The key things you start looking for are deployable artifacts. What does this piece of code generate that I can deploy to a server? Uh, in in the case of, then the next step is, how the hell do I deploy it? And what do I need to set around it to actually work? Now, of course, if you're thinking about an integration services package, it has loads of configuration stuff that you need to set up before it'll actually work. So it's that kind of thing that you have to work, worry about. So I've used Team City in the past quite considerably. Um, there's also a product called Jenkins. There's a few competitors out there. They are specifically designed for, for building and deploying uh, and testing uh, your, uh, your, your, your software. Now, somebody mentioned to me earlier TFS. TFS, yes, is a source code control system, and it also, also has a, an ability to build stuff. But it's, it's pretty limited as to what it can the, the steps it can go through. Uh, I'll show you a TFS, a Team City screen in a moment. But the key thing with um, Team City is that it has a server component, which is um, the one with TC in the middle, um, which sits on top of a SQL database or, or Oracle, if you want one. <laughs> we really don't want an Oracle database. But anyway, it'll sit on top of any database. Um, and it, it controls and one or more build agents that are basically just a glorified PC with Visual Studio on it and all the other d build tools um, that, you, that you need to do. And Team City Server, when you do a check-in, because it monitors the, um, uh, the source code control system, SCC, it monitors that. As soon as you do a check-in, it will actually go, ah, I need to do a build, and it will start off a build. And the kind of builds that you get involved in are doing, you know, building the artifacts, which is building DAC packs for, I'll come back on, onto that, deploying them, doing a load of post-deploy tests, loading some, a cut-down data set, uh, and post-load tests. So that's what your build agent's doing. And of course, testers can also check in tests, which can be unit tests for the code, or can be all other tests. I'll come back to that as well. Here's a typical um, Team City screen. 
Um, this is uh, showing there's this is a data, big data warehouse, lots of different databases that are part of the project. Um, as you can see, this particular um, less successful build here, it's got the artifacts that were generated from that, which is basically the, you know, you say this build will generate these artifacts and it's, they're there then, you can actually download them from here and deploy them up, but obviously then they're, next, they're available to the next step in the build. So all of these are dependent on each other. So ETL databases are dependent on archive. So it requires that to be successful before this will bother even trying to kick off. So they're all dependent and they're all triggered on each other. So eventually you get to the point where it's um, going to deploy, test, load and test, um, which I'll talk about it a bit more. But um, you think with Team City, of course, when, you, when the build fails, you need to assign go fix the problems and that's where it, Team City is great because it, it will highlight the fact that you've um, uh, the build has failed it's got a little pop-up that comes up on your desktop um, and you know, it'll say last check-in by John he fucked it up go fix it you can, that's basically what it says and then you go and go in there and you say I'm gonna fix it um, and then the good thing when you're actually going to the kind of the, the build uh, screen say what is it what's 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 wrong with this you can see things like the the test test sits run uh, you know and it says 16 tests have failed and these are the ones that have failed and actually when you click on them it'll actually give you details of the test results and stuff like that so it's great i mean it's just, it just gives you all that feedback if you're doing this kind of stuff manually and you're doing it all with powershell and doing it manually you'll, you'll never get to the point where, where you, within an hour of imp installing team city you can get all of this stuff working. Um, this, I think the key thing on this slide, I mean, it's just talking about through the idea of you building your artifacts. This, you get Team City to build your artifacts, deploy them, deploy, uh, test, do some tests. The key thing with, if, in a data warehouse context, is you write, you put, provide a, a, a small, very small fixed data set that you get the, the system to load through all the different stages in the, in the data flow. And then once it's done that, you do some post-load tests. And the first one, of course, is it checks that the data result, you know, if your values in your cube match the results you expect. And that is the key to doing, implementing CI in a data warehouse context, having that fixed data set. It doesn't have to be big. In fact, the better, smaller it is, the better. But the thing is that as, as your uh, project moves on and you say, oh, I found a bug with, in this particular circumstance for this type of bond or whatever trading entity or insurance entity it might be, we need, you know, it, it has to show this value. And you, so you put in a, what we call regression tests, but they're all tests at the end of the day. Um, uh, you put a regression test to prove that that data got through the system uh, in a particular, particular way. So you put some more fixed data in to prove it went through the, the data flow in a particular way. PowerShell is the glue for it all. Um, and I think the thing is, if you're not familiar with PowerShell, just keep calm, just learn it. It is particularly, it's pretty straightforward. Admittedly, a few huge amounts of examples out there are for administrators of either DBAs or, or just administrators of, of um, the network generally, but there is, there's also some very good books. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't want a surprise at the weekend for, for um, uh, PowerShell and SQL Server. Um, pretty, pretty good. Um, it's part of the Windows management framework. Its current version is version four. Um, it's got a you know proper scripting environment. It's got try catch and all those kind of error handling and all that kind of stuff. It's so easy to read and write XML. It's untrue. Um, in fact, it's kind of so, uh, you kind of look at it and go, oh, is that really reading the XML? Yes, it is. Um, and it's got lots of commandlets and particularly relevant for SQL Server, the, you know, invoke a SQL command, invoke a, uh, uh, an AS command, which basically runs a uh, uh, XMLA um, statement. What? No introduction to Sarke? Okay. I obviously missed a slide out, but... <laughs> Um, Sarke is an extension to um, PowerShell. So it's, it's basically focused on a build, building stuff, 
well, it, it, it calls itself a build kind of a, a tool. In reality, you can be used it to, to build, deploy, whatever. And the great thing is that you have this thing called a depends. And they say, I want to build my databases, then I want to deploy them, then I want to load my fixed data sets, then I want to run my tests. And you can have this amount of code to do each of those tests. And this, oh, this is only longer because I've got two databases. You know, It's really, really simple. The only thing, you know, you set up a bit of stuff of like, where's my SQL package to go and do my deploy? And where's my um, DT exec to actually um, uh, execute my integration services packages when I load the data? But that basically is a whole build script in one. And the thing with this is that you can get Team City to call these individual entry points and and do that for you and prove it work, works. If you're not who's, not, who's not using SQL Server data tools? Sorry, can I just ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Is there a, a part of Team City or is it a... Sarkey and PowerShell, no, they're... they're uh, Sarkey, PowerShell obviously is from Microsoft and it's the free download. Yeah. Uh, Sarkey is a free download, it's uh, open source. It's, it's actually, the actual source for it is thousand lines long, you just keep it as a module separately, so, uh, developed some by some guy called Jacob, I think. Uh, it's very, it's very, very neat. Um, uh, yeah, SQL Server Data Tools. It, it, it didn't really matter, unless you were working with SQL Server 2000, which version of back end you've got, you can work with SQL Server Data Tools today. Um, it will support all your, back, all your old database uh, environments, and you can bring the code, it, suck the code into it. I do recommend that you don't try and upgrade old database projects that were, were using um, Visual Studio data tools. Um, they have a completely different layout, which is completely obscure to, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's an awful, t awful tool set. Um, uh, you know, it has some benefits, but it doesn't compile into a deployable artifact, which is one of the key, key things. Um, but so I'd recommend you basically deploy your database and then suck it into the um, SQL Server data tools. It's so easy, it'll take you five minutes and suddenly you've got everything and you can check it into um, source code control. The key thing about a SQL Server data tools, it's a, it's a, a deployable artifact. It generates a DAT pack, which is actually a, a glorified zip file under the open packaging convention, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the thing with, uh, you, with this, you can, MS Build will deploy, will you know, take your solution and build your DAC packs for you. And then you use something called SQL Package to actually do the deploy uh, with what's well, called to publish, to publish the database. Um, with integration services, if you look at kind of how I'm going to work with integration services in a Team City environment or in a, in a CI environment. Uh, it depends whether you're doing the file mode stuff, which is the old tech way of doing things. If you're doing the old things, the actual package is the deployable artifact. As you probably realize, the build actually does nothing useful. Um, just copies them into the, uh, into the uh, bin, bin file, so what? Um, but with file mode configuration, obviously there's a load of stuff about um, uh, you know, usually have a, a local XML file that says where all the, where the uh, database is that actually has all the SSIS configuration table. It's a normal way of setting up maybe an environment variable, that kind of stuff. But you can use PowerShell to, to set all that kind of stuff up. Um, Bimmel, of course, is a, a, a great tool. I, I really strongly, if you're not using Bimmel, I strongly recommend you go that, do that. I think it's, it's reasonably difficult to set it up so Bimmel will compile in the CI server. Um, but of course, usually the, the developer's checking stuff in. I was on a mob project where the developer che was checking the stuff in and then doing some stuff, tweaking the package um, manually in the, in the GUI because Bimmel wasn't, didn't cover that particular base of functionality. So it may or may not be a good idea to, to, to um, build from Bimmel on the CI server. It, when you're in project mode, which of course the new, the new technology, it's a whole different, um, um, a whole different uh, game. You've got an IS pack, which is a, again a glorified zip file in the open standards uh, format. Um, and that's your deployable artifact and you use something called IS deployment wizard to, to deploy it. Um, 
And of course, you can then use all the new catalog views in the um, SSIS DB catalog to create projects, folders, and all those kind of stuff. And there's store proc to do all of that. And of course, you can run a SQL command script from PowerShell with all the relevant variables. And that's how you should set it up. Uh, for analysis services, pain in the ass, right? <laughs> I spent years working with analysis service. They never invite, they never got it, improved its uh, ability to build and stuff. So the build has to be done with the Visual Studio, unfortunately. So you have to invoke DevM, which of course is the next is a Windows executable. And if you fire it off with PowerShell, PowerShell goes, "Oh, I've fired that off. I don't actually need to care about the waiting for it to finish." So the way you actually force it to finish is you put out hyphen null at the end of your uh, statement, pipe it into out null and it awaits. Uh, of course it generates an AS database file and a load of little config files. Um, that's, and you deploy though that with your uh, analysis services deployment wizard. And of course you get PowerShell to go and edit all those little config files so it gets deployed onto the right server and stuff. If you want an even better way of deploying, you can use my tool, which I developed myself, SQL Server Analysis Services Partition Manager. Uh, it works with tabular and um, uh, multidimensional, and it deploys, but it's basically using AMO, and then it'll create all the partitions for you, and it'll carry on creating the partitions throughout the life of the cube, so it's a lot easier than screwing around with them. Um, <coughs> uh, your own in-house packages and stuff. Key to, to CI is the test framework. Now, the problem with the test frameworks is that, of course, most of them are written in C-sharp, and most BI developers don't know C-sharp, so therefore they don't want to go near it. Um, I came across this suite, which is very flexible. For some reason, it has a platypus as its emblem. Um, and it's essentially, it's, well, MBI stands for uh, N-Unit uh, Business Intelligence Framework. Um, it's an open framework. It's out there on the web, web uh, on the mbi.io as the website. Um, you basically just write a piece of XML that defines your test. Uh, when I first heard, oh, XML, that's, you know, that sounds like a nasty thing. Well, the thing actually, it's so easy to generate a test. I mean, I wrote in a proof of concept I did recently, I wrote 500 tests within a few minutes by simply doing a select star from uh, select various fields for XML, and it just generated the text tests exactly in the right format. And I just pasted them into my thing, set the connection string, and bingo, it was comparing two databases and proving that they had the same count of records in there. Uh, dead simple test, the kind of test that should be in your in your CI. And of course, you use PowerShell to generate. Uh, they also have a sweet uh, tool actually called GenBI and GenBL, Gen which um, will generate a test for you. Um, but the key thing is it will run SQL, it will run MDX and DAX, and then it will also compare the results of one set of you know, SQL query versus MDX and compare the results. So it's pretty good. It will also compare your, your model and check that, uh, that out. Um, as I said, it will check the results of a query. It'll against, it'll do it against a static data set, you know, which is basically defined in, in line in the XML, or against a CSV file, or, as I said, the results of another query, and there's lots of extra functionality about to tolerance and rounding and stuff like that. Um, and you can do performance testing um, and check the cube structure and see if the members are correct on the dimension, that kind of stuff. So it's quite uh, sophisticated. My last slide. So this is nothing to do with CI. <laughs> well, it is and isn't. It's about automating uh, the generation of code. And T4 is, that, uh, T4 is a uh, technology that's been around since Visual Studio 2005 and allows you to generate code out of other code. In the context of a SQL Server Data Tools uh, environment, you can actually um, generate from a set of tables a whole set of triggers, store procs, whatever. Um, and I've written uh, an extensive blog all about how to do that. The example that use, it uses is this, uh, often you have a uh, reporting environment, um, regulatory and reporting environment, where you have to actually track the changes to a particular table. And often that's implemented by having 
a copy of the table as a history table and a history schema and a trigger that does updates that table whenever you get a, an update or a, an addition or whatever. If you had 200 tables, you've got to generate 400, obje 400 objects, you know, 200 history tables and 400, uh, 200 <coughs> update triggers. I could do that in 10 minutes with T4 templates. That's why I'm talking about it here. Um, it's, it's, you can kind of fit it in with your CI, but it's not, you know, it's something you do before you check your code in, and you just basically build your templates and stuff like that. All documented on my blog. So that's it. That's CI and the data warehouse. Hopefully, I, I was, was out of time. <laughs> there we go. Any questions? Come on, Chris, you must have a question for me. You're dying to show me up in public. <laughs> question. I've, I've, I've worked on projects and environments before where people um, develop stuff in a legacy sort of, sort of way and they take the approach of retrofitting uh, uh, CI. Yeah. To the um, SIS, so yeah. mm -hmm. you would see these people like, you know, boil the ocean in a single SSIS package. Oh, yeah, huge. The, in, the point being is that, in my mind, you've got to develop your stuff, your, your, your artifacts in a certain sort of way for it to be conducive to CI. Well, you certainly got to be configurable. Yeah. I mean, that's the key thing. I mean, the thing is with SQL Server data tools, yeah. it does enforce you to not have hard-coded database names in there and, and make them all variables. With, with obviously integration services, um, there's loads of different ways of doing if the old way package configurations and the, in the new way environments. It was, it, it's a lot nicer in the, obviously, the 2012 version. Well, we would say, you know, if you've got people who, who uh, I don't know, it's not a good practice, but they, they develop great big monolithic objects. I mean, you, you see, um, sometimes see job ads and, and, and they'll say, uh, Oh yes, you know, we'll stuff some of the right complex SSI, SSIS packages, or, yeah. or you know, we'll be able to write really complex MDX. And you sort of think, really, how, you know, is this this would be actually design this. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, well, I think the thing is that often you look at these, these complicated things. I mean, there's a typical example would be where you've got a package that um, basically just run, reads the content of a table yeah. and runs stored proc, you know, a series of stored procs. And they go, oh, I shall make it do things in parallel by reading the two, the you know, the, the processing every three or fours. Yeah, it's kind of, and it's like, but the thing is actually, if you write it in BIML, you go, okay, right, I'll write a, I'll write a packet, you know, a BIML statement that creates a package that has all forty of those store procs named in it because it's so easy to regenerate. But I, I, I take your point. If you've got a monolithic crap, you've got. A, problem of how the hell do you figure out all its uh, functionality that they've put in there. Uh, because it, I think in integration services, that's one of the biggest drawback. There's so much hidden behind the scenes. You know, it's that this, this little dialogue and this particular... Um, oh, it's, it's one of the most evil tools in the BI stuff. Yeah, which is why somebody came up with BIML. I mean, you can look at BIML and it's like, well, that's simple. Yeah. Why is it so complicated in the, in the GUI? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned BIML. I mean, my understanding is you can use it for developing cubes as well. Yeah, but only if you buy the product from. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, the the compilers are available free of charge in Bits Helper for integration services packages only, but not not for cubes. Right. I've never tried using it for cubes. I'm not. Uh, I couldn't be asked to. I don't see what the problem is with cubes. To be honest, you know, in terms of. I know there's a few obscure things, but. Any other questions? Um, Sarkey, is that, uh, Sarkey, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they for some reason, they decided to get rid of the P for, right, okay. for pronunciation. It actually says on their website, drop the P, Sarkey, and that's why it's got a bottle of Sarkey. It's, it's just a PowerShell module. Um, so so you've, the first thing you do on your, in your own, well, you don't, actually, you don't even include it because you call, you call Sarkey and then the build you might reference your own module that you, is written in its kind of syntax. Um, but it, by default, it will find a, a file called default.ps1, reads that in, <coughs> and then it, it processes it, and it looks for all these de the depends. So there's depends. There's a few other keywords that they, they support. Um, but it just makes it a lot easier to... Uh, it, and it has its own exec to exec off a process to, and trap the errors from it, because often PowerShell will just 
exact process but won't trap the error. Your example there was with Team City. Does yeah, it work yeah. outside of Team City? PowerShell is PowerShell. I mean, you can do it with any other. What can you use PSARK for? Oh, yes. Yeah, from I mean, PSARK is a, you have to use it with PowerShell. But, but obviously, PowerShell you can use with Team City or Jenkins or any of these build agents. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if you're not using it, do use PowerShell. It is superb. PowerShell well, it, we use, but I've never heard of PSARK. So yeah, I mean, it's just a, it, I think it's just um, makes it easier to build, do a build script. It, it can do a whole, it can do, you can set up a whole build environment on your know, desktop or, or, or th and build and deploy environment using PowerShell. So you don't need Team City to do that. But the thing is that with Team City is it, you're getting it to invoke it automatically. <coughs> you get the deployable artifacts. You, you, get, uh, you get your PowerShell to generate uh, NuGet packages that have got all your integration services packages in it and you can deploy them. You just get to the next level with, with things like Team City. But um, you don't have to ha use them. You can, you can do everything manually. But the thing is, you don't get the, you know, the build run log and say, oh, these are all the builds. And um, it, it, it's a lot easier with a proper tool that's actually designed for it. Um, yeah. And TFS, I think it's a bit too, because we were talking earlier. I think, I think it's, I think the actual TFS kind of team builder, whatever they call it, is a bit kind of limited. It's really just for building doing the build and not really the deploy and anything after that. Team City, your build end is a choice? Then. I think it's, well, uh, the, the two that seem to be very popular are Team City and Jenkins. Right. And I think of, from everybody I've talked to that's actually use both, they mm -hmm. always prefer Team City. Um, and the thing is with Team City, it's, um, well, I think they're both, some people have told me that Jenkins is more expensive. I've never really looked, looked into the, linking, uh, the licensing. But Team City, a build agent, well, if you've only got uh, 10 projects and three build agents, it's free. So it's like if you, can, you can set it up and get everything working. And it's only when you actually get a very sophisticated build environment that you actually all need to get a, a, a license for it. So yeah. John, John there's, there's one other thing. Is, um, you're talking about CI with Team City. Would you ever have confidence to use that to deploy to production? Once you've gone I, I think deploy to, deploy to production you should never do. I think this this we're, we're this trying to automate certain bits of that. Yeah, I think the, the deploy to all the other environments, yeah. absolutely, because it really proves everything's working properly and as you would expect. So you've taken one package, <coughs> one bit of work through the CI, yeah. through to the other environments. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to change? Well, I agree. This, this, technically, this shouldn't be, but. I think there's always you, you, some gotchas, you know. There's always some um, some stuff that doesn't quite fit into the framework you've got, in, you know, whether it's set up a Team City or whatever. That doesn't, you know, fits outside. Somebody else delivers something that's not really under your control that has to go into production. Um, so there's some IBM modules that we got across the road in Hiscox that um, get delivered by a different team. It's not in our build, so. Yeah, we, you know, it's like we, we have to make sure that... If like, your source control is strict enough, you can probably do it. Oh, if you, t if you source control, yeah, and then you use a product called Octopus Deploy, yes. which I've dropped the slide off, which, which uh, then does the deployment. Um, uh, so you said TFS is not doing much of... TFS is a great source code control system. No, no, but even... Uh, probably not good to get, which is free. Because we have <laughs> some uh, POC on 2030. Whatever is there in Octopus Deploy, we can do the same stuff in the TFS, but might be you might think well, in the your Octopus Deploy and TFS not the same kind of product. I don't right? know. I'm, I'm saying like maybe the the second part of it, like you you, you yeah. uh, the release manag manager kind of thing. Yeah. So which is uh, well, something's uh, going mainly for Octopus Deploy, like it's just release manager kind of stuff. Like even we can split yeah. build, deploy, and then release. Yeah. So build, yeah, any any tool can do, TFS, Team City, and Octopus Deploy. And uh, deployment, again, TFS, you have to yeah. leave it. It's not yeah. available in the back, yeah. but you have to write yeah. yeah. script yeah. to do it. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> the promoting the changes, that is the only thing in Octo Octopus Deploy can do now as well as, like, so um, we are doing the POCs, uh, I'm just saying, like, TFS seems to be better man. So I'm just trying to understand, like, what, what is giving? What is the difference between Team City and uh, PFS, which is giving? I can't tell you feature feature. Right? Uh, 
feature for feature. Anyway, I'm an independent consultant and I'm available for hire. Right, I'm gone. <laughs>